Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. <laughs> that was one of those times where I almost said your name, just because sometimes we're tempted oddly to do that. Yeah, that's a weird thing that happens sometimes. <laughs> uh, the origin for this episode is a little bit loopy. Come with me on the journey. Uh, it's because of the new Star Wars movie, The Rise of Skywalker. Don't worry, this is not a Star Warsy episode. So if you're like, I don't want to hear about that, you're not going to. But there is this one particular section of that film that strongly reminded me visually of a particular painting. And the artist who painted that painting has been on my list for a while because uh, that painting is seen all over the place. But I would hazard a guess that few people outside of art history circles actually know who painted it. <laughs> uh, I checked. It has actually been a little while since we've talked about a painter on a new episode. We did have a Caravaggio classic recently, but we haven't done a, a recent new painter biography. So today we are going to talk about Caspar David Friedrich, who was a painter most closely associated with the German Romantic movement. And we will talk about that painting that this whole shenanigans reminded me of uh, to give you context later on in the story. Yeah, so... Caspar David Friedrich was born September 5th, 1774, in Greifswald, Pomerania. So for a quick reference, Pomerania was a region along the Baltic Sea that went through a lot of shifts over hundreds of years, as is the case with a lot of that general part of the world. But today, most of what was once Pomerania is in Poland today, and a smaller portion of it on the western side was incorporated into Germany. Greifswald, where where uh, Friedrich was born, is part of the area that's in modern-day Germany. And Friedrich's parents, Adolf Gottlieb Friedrich and Sophie Dorothea Breckley Friedrich, were devout Lutherans who had moved to Greifswald in 1761. Their hope was that the harbor town would offer a good supply of raw materials for soap and candle making. That was Adolf's trade. And it did. His little company grew over time into a much larger enterprise which lived on long after Adolf was dead. Friedrich's childhood was not idyllic at all, though, because his family experienced one tragic event after another. He had nine siblings. He was the sixth in the birth order. And when he was just seven years old, his mother died. After that point, the family had a nurse named Mutter Heide, and she stepped in to help raise the children. The following year, though, Casper's sister Elizabeth also died from an illness. And then on December 8th of 1787, when Casper was 13, another loss left him deeply mournful. His brother, Johann Christopher, drowned when he fell through the ice in a skating accident, and Caspar witnessed this. This is sometimes relayed as though Johann was saving Caspar from drowning himself, but uh, that appears to be a conflation of two separate events. Caspar had nearly drowned in a similar accident prior to Johann's death. And Johann had, I think, saved him. You see this story written out so many ways, it's a little bit hard to apply pattern recognition and, and try to get to the facts. But the accident that claimed Johann's life appears to have been a separate incident in which Kaspar was not in any danger. Four years after Johann's death, another of the Friedrich siblings died of an illness. This time it was Maria. And in spite of all of this tragedy, Casper seemed to remain pretty attached to the family home and the town throughout his life, although he did settle elsewhere later. He visited home and made drawings and paintings of the family and of Greifswald pretty often. Yeah, it's one of those things where people say this early stuff really um, informed his work later on. But he did seem to really enjoy going home and being with his family. So there's a little bit of disparity there in in how he related to home life. Yeah, not not a situation where he felt it too painful to go back there. Exactly. But a situation that colored his later work. Right. And as a teenager, Casper began decorating religious texts. And this is the earliest art we have examples of from his life. At 16, he started taking painting lessons, formally from Johann Gottfried Quisdorp at the University of Greifswald. Quisdorp was an architect who also painted, and he taught both of these subjects as well as mathematics and engineering. And prior to studying with Quisdorp, most of the art that Casper had been exposed to was religious imagery that he had seen at church. But with this new teacher, his knowledge of art history expanded considerably because he was shown work by many masters, which Quisdorp had in his private collection, including paintings by Flemish Baroque painter Antony von Dyck. 
Quistorp was not his only teacher during this time. He was also studying literature and aesthetics with Thomas Torild, who was the university's librarian as well as a professor. He was Swedish and had made a name for himself as a poet, but also had started writing about social reform and was part of the Sturm und Drang movement, which preceded Romanticism. It becomes pretty easy to trace a line from Caspar Friedrich's mentors uh, and his work. Yeah, if you kind of look at the roots of what he was getting educated in and how he evolved, he's almost like the story of Romanticism in Germany. At 1794, at the age of 20, Friedrich enrolled at Copenhagen's Danish Royal Academy to study art. And this program was based on the French model of teaching artists. So students would start with drawing, mostly copying existing work, and then they would learn how to cast copies of famous sculptures, which sounds like a very fun thing to learn. Uh, And then life drawing and composition were studied. And throughout the program, the more mathematical concepts that are vital to art, such as perspective and geometry, were also included. You might have noticed that we haven't mentioned any painting classes in that curriculum. There weren't any offered formally as part of the program, and that wasn't an uncommon scenario for art schools at the time. Caspar Friedrich never actually studied painting at the Royal Academy. He took classes from painters, but they were teaching things like art theory rather than hands-on painting technique. While other students were able to pay for private painting classes from the faculty, that was not an option for Casper due to the financial limitations that he had. But he was painting on his own and applying the lessons that he had learned from other media. While Friedrich was in art school in Copenhagen, landscape painting was growing in popularity throughout Europe. And some of Copenhagen's established artists were producing landscapes for money, even if they were known for other styles. Portraitist Jens Yule, for example, adapted the style that he normally used when capturing people on canvas, and he applied it to capturing the mood or place of a scene. And his work was a major influence on Friedrich. In 1798, Friedrich left art school and went home. He didn't graduate from the Danish Royal Academy. The exact reason that he left in the middle of his studies is not known. There has been some speculation that he just couldn't afford to stay there any longer. But through a connection Friedrich made through his teacher, Johann Quistorp, Kasper was able to set himself up in Dresden with the hopes of establishing an art career. Dresden had developed a reputation as a haven for the arts, and Friedrich found it so to his liking that he called it home for the rest of his life. But though he was still pursuing art, he was also doing all kinds of work to make a living in Dresden initially. He worked as a tutor, an engraver, and a tour guide. Yeah, one of the biographies that I read kind of speculated that he might not have been a great tour guide because he was not from Dresden, and he started doing this work almost immediately after having arrived. So he may have been completely just faking his way through it just so he could make ends meet. Uh, And luckily, he did not stick with any of those jobs that he may or may not have been great at for long. We're going to talk about what he did end up doing after we first pause for a quick sponsor break. The Dresden Academy of Art had been established in 1764, and Casper enrolled after he relocated to the city. Incidentally, that institution continues today under the name Dresden Academy of Fine Arts. And while he was there, Casper continued developing his skills, copying the works of other artists as studies, as well as evolving his own style. One of the prominent teachers at the Academy of Art was Swiss painter Adrian Zing, whose landscapes hang today in museums around the world. And he, too, became undoubtedly an influence on young Friedrich. And it was thanks to the exhibitions staged by the Academy of Art that Friedrich started to gain a reputation as a painter. Dresden at this point was known for its art collections. So to show there and get decent reviews, occasionally being singled out when showing with other young artists, that really bolstered Friedrich's germinating career. And while some of these pieces were landscapes, that was a style for which he would eventually become famous, others were sepia and watercolor figure tableau that represented moments of human drama, often grief. He was still experimenting with his work at this point. And in that spirit of experimentation, 
In the early 1800s, Caspar Friedrich explored a number of avenues to make a living solely as an artist without taking non-art supplemental jobs. So he did a number of landscape etchings, which were popular enough that prominent rulers purchased them. And he also ventured into woodcut prints of some of his figure studies. And those woodcut prints were made by Caspar's brother Christian. So he would make the, make the woodcut, send it to his brother, and then his brother would do the printing. But neither of those efforts seemed to keep Frederick's attention as an artist, and he turned to portraits, including self-portraits, which he often did in chalk and pencil. In 1801, Caspar Friedrich returned to Greifswald for an extended visit. He didn't go back to Dresden until 1802, more than a year after he'd left. During this trip, he started really establishing some of the hallmarks of his landscape style. He was working in sepia, and to make the most of the simplicity of the color palette, he played up the contrast of light and dark to conjure a sense of atmosphere. The coast around Greifswald, particularly Cape Arcona, was the primary subject of these works, and he would recreate images of that cape over and over throughout his career. Back in Dresden, Friedrich continued his work in sepia landscapes. He also had a sort of evolution of his work that derived from his previous style. So he once again created a number of landscapes, and this time they included human figures in them. But in these early 1800s pieces, the figures were much smaller than in his previous works. Those figures were still often in dramatic situations, but the landscape was really the dominant element of the composition. In 1803, Caspar Friedrich exhibited a number of his sepia landscapes at the Dresden Academy of Art, and this exhibit was really successful. It was also that year that fellow painter Philip Otto Runge introduced Friedrich to the Dresden Romantics. This was a circle of influential writers in the city. Also in that social circle was Ludwig Tieck, who was a poet and novelist whose work had really cemented the idea of Romanticism in Germany in the late 18th century. While Caspar Friedrich was never in the inner circle of this crowd, and some of its most influential members had died or moved into other pursuits by the time Friedrich was introduced to them, their presence in the Dresden creative scene and his socializing with them informed his efforts going forward. Also, as an aside, just to... uh make sure disinformation is not part of this picture. If you look at some sources, they may mention the writer Novalis as a member of this social circle and the way it's phrased. I saw this in several places, so I'm not dogging any one one person or one um, outlet. It sort of makes it seem like Novalis and Friedrich were contemporaries, but Novalis, which was a pseudonym for Friedrich Leopold, the Baron of Hardenberg, actually died in 1801, and that would have been two years before Casper made the acquaintance of the group. So those two men did not know each other at all. So if you see a list where it's like, he knew the Dresden Romantics that included these people, Novalis was not really there at that point. In 1804, Friedrich created a sepia landscape titled My Burial, which featured the artist's coffin being interred in a churchyard, and that churchyard was adjacent to a falling down abbey. This particular work no longer exists. We only have descriptions and reviews of it. And those reviews clearly recognize that Friedrich's work had a spiritual and melancholic tone to it, which put it right in stride with the growing Romantic movement. When Friedrich entered two of his sepia landscapes into competition at the Weimar Friends of Art Society in 1805, it proved to be a significant moment that established him in his chosen field as an artist. That competition was established and judged by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who praised Friedrich's work and granted him half the prize. The other half went to a painting on Hercules cleaning the Augean stables. One of the mysteries of Caspar David Friedrich's career is why exactly he hadn't started working in oils in earnest until his 30s. He had favored drawing and watercolor early in his career. But then around 1807 or 1808, when he was about 34, Caspar Friedrich painted The Cross in the Mountains, which is now known as the Techen Altar. This was his first work that gained really wide recognition, and it set the stage for his reputation of representing religious themes in landscape imagery. This painting was created as an altarpiece, and it stands out in that regard precisely because it's a landscape rather than an image that centralizes the religious iconography. The initial showing of this painting was at Christmas time, and Friedrich tried to light his studio in conditions similar to that of a chapel. And while accounts from this initial viewing suggest that everyone on hand was awed by the work and the presentation, this painting was not appreciated unanimously when it was introduced. 
In it, Christ's crucifixion is depicted on a cross that sits alone atop a mountain. No humans visible, and only the trees that grow on the slope are also present. And the use of landscape painting to represent the religious in this way was considered inappropriate and irreverent by many. This painting got a lot of attention and publicity, but that publicity was because its merit was debated rather than because of the artistry. In 1809, Friedrich published his own notes on the painting in the periodical Journal of Luxury and Fashion. He explained that the mountain is faith, the trees are the enduring hope of humankind, and the three rays of light that shine from behind the mountain as the sun sets are the light of God. The setting sun indicates that humankind's relationship with God has shifted. Friedrich wrote, quote, Jesus Christ, nailed to the tree, is turned here toward the sinking sun, the image of the eternal life-giving Father. With Jesus' teaching, an old world dies, that time when God the Father moved directly on the earth. This sun sank, and the earth was not able to grasp the departing light any longer. Friedrich never published any other commentary about this work or any of his others. Yeah, he kind of got so frustrated with the interpretations of his work that were being circulated in the press that he wrote this one thing. And uh, I, we don't know if he just, after that point, was like, I'm never explaining myself again. <laughs> or uh, if he just kind of stepped away from the, the idea of paying attention to his critics or not. The year after his explanation of the symbolism and meaning of the cross in the mountains, uh, Friedrich was made a member of the Berlin Academy. He had exhibited two works there in Berlin, The Monk by the Sea, which is a large painting which features a very small figure of a monk standing on a beach before a vast expanse of dark sea and sky. And the other piece is The Abbey in the Oak Forest, which is also a very large piece, and it features a crumbling abbey surrounded by leafless, twisted trees, and a procession of monks carrying a coffin into the ruins by the light of two candles. Both of these paintings were purchased at the Berlin Exhibition by Friedrich Wilhelm III of Prussia. In 1816, Friedrich was also made a member of the Dresden Academy. This appointment meant that he had a small annual stipend, and that regular income came in handy when he decided to get married in 1818. His new wife, Caroline, was 25, so she was 19 years younger than he was. Her father was a tradesman in Dresden who specialized in dyeing textiles. And marriage changed Friedrich's work. And we're going to talk about how after we first pause for a word from one of the sponsors that keeps Stuff You Missed in History class going. This moment uh, of getting married in Caspar David Friedrich's life is one that precipitated a change, as we said before the break, in his work. He painted chalk cliffs on Rügen uh, after his honeymoon, and it offers up imagery that seems to shift away from his work up to that point. For one, there is a woman in the painting in a red dress seated with her back to the viewer. She's on the left side of the painting, and two men are also in the painting, one kind of in the middle and one on the right. And the trio looks out over these cliffs, and two sailboats can be seen on the water beyond them. The color palette of this painting is much brighter and softer than Friedrich's usual oil paintings, and the three figures are often interpreted as representing love, faith, and hope. The more literal interpretation of the figures is that they are, in fact, Caroline, Caspar, and Caspar's brother Heinrich. This painting seems to indicate that Friedrich's state of mind changed somewhat with what appeared to be a happy marriage, although his contemporary, Carl Gustav Carus, wrote an account that said that Friedrich remained the same person even after he and Caroline got married and started their family. They had three children together, two daughters and a son, over the years between 1819 and 1823. And this also brings up the point of Friedrich's disposition generally. Because his work is often dark in tone and centered around themes of death and the rituals associated with it, there is often this presumption that we mentioned earlier that the losses of his childhood stayed with him and cast a gloom on his life. But there are accounts from friends of his that he was also a very funny and joyous person. Philosopher Gottlieb Heinrich von Schubert described Caspar as a man who had an odd mixture of moods, but if people only saw the melancholy, they, quote, only knew half the man. Once he had gotten married to Caroline, women started appearing with a lot more frequency in Friedrich's works, including the beautiful Woman Before the Rising Sun. That depicts a woman with arms extended from her side slightly, and her back facing the viewer, looking at what's either the rising or the setting sun in golden and orange hues. 
It's been named as both the rising and the setting at different times. Yeah, it is a very, very striking painting. And if you look at a lot of his work, which is a little bit more on the gloomy side, and then you look at that, you almost have this moment where if the figure style weren't so similar, you'd be like, I don't think this is the same painter. Um, I really, really love that painting because it is so uh, warm and, and beautiful. Not long after he started his family in 1818-1820, Casper painted Two Men Contemplating the Moon, which features exactly what the title suggests. Two men stand in the left one-third of the landscape, looking at the moon, which sits just left of center in the composition. And the surrounding ground, and tr- there's a big tree, and they're all painted in warm tones. And this painting was very popular, so much so that the artist made several variational copies of it, some with a man and a woman, and in varying color palettes. This is also the period when Friedrich painted the piece that Holly referenced at the very top of the episode, which is Wanderer Above the Sea Fog. You've almost certainly seen this painting. It gets used a lot because it's really evocative. It features a man in the foreground with the back to the viewer looking out over cliffs and rocks on a coast that are coated in a really dense mist. It was used as the cover for a paperback edition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein that was popular for years. Yeah, it was one of those, if you studied Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in high school in the 80s, you saw this painting <laughs> uh, because it was used as a cover. It's also been used in a innumerable other places. And despite his seeming happiness with family life, Friedrich did slowly become kind of withdrawn from the outside world. Some of this, too, was political. Uh, During the Napoleonic Wars, the French used Dresden as their rallying point and the French occupation during that time, to which Caspar Friedrich was in opposition, seemed to catalyze depressive episodes which would recur throughout the remainder of his life. So the introduction of Caroline into his world may have simply been a temporary reprieve from a larger cycle of depressive periods. In 1824, Friedrich started a job as a professor at the Royal Dresden Art Academy. This was only a part-time position, which was much to his dismay. He wanted to teach full-time because his art was not in demand the way it had been. But the same problem carried over to teaching— The school's leadership feared that his style was so singular that he'd have a hard time teaching students a more generalized curriculum. Over the next decade, his income dwindled significantly as romanticism fell out of favor, and only his most devoted patrons continued buying his work. Just the same, some of his most impressive work was done during this period of economic downturn. The Gros Gehege near Dresden, painted in 1832, features a vast expanse of pasture interrupted by elements of standing water. It's rendered as though the viewer is slightly above the ground, and it's at once really breathtaking and a little bit unsettling. 1835's Wreck in the Moonlight is a dark nighttime scene of a shipwreck, the vessel lying broken and sideways in the water, having rammed into a rock formation just off the coast. Also in 1835, Friedrich painted The Stages of Life, and that features what appears to be a family at the seaside with two young children, their parents, and an older gentleman. I'm not familiar with this artwork, but Holly has noted that she would have thought that it was a woman in the other figure without um, having more knowledge about the scene. Yeah, I, I for years have thought that was a woman <laughs> and uh, because I had not read any any art criticism or art analysis of it. And then I did, and I was like, oh, okay, it's a man. Uh, yeah, just FYI, if you look at it, know that I, too, suffered the same confusion. Correlated to this, uh, to the people in, in the port are five boats in the water. They're all at varying distances from the shore. This painting has been analyzed and interpreted a lot of times since its creation, and it's believed that the figures are Friedrich himself, as the elderly man, as well as the other members of his family. Yeah, and those are kind of, like, extended. They're not just his immediate family, uh, but also, like, sibling, nieces, etc. On June 26, 1835, Friedrich had a severe stroke. He never recovered fully, and while he still painted, his abilities were pretty limited, and he never worked in oil again. In 1837, there was a second stroke that left him with much more paralysis. Caspar David Friedrich died on May 7, 1840. Although he and his work were considered outmoded by the time he died, his work gained some new interest in the 20th century. In 1906, 32 of his paintings were exhibited in Berlin, and that exhibit sparked new interest in his work. 
Some of that interest in his work was less than flattering, though. Uh, The Nazi party was very fond of Friedrich's art, believing that the themes in his work aligned with the party ideology. As Nazi Blut and Boden, blood and soil propaganda, often depicted a rural life, uh, the natural landscapes of Germany, Friedrich's nature landscapes were really easy to appropriate as reverent representations of German land. After World War II, it took decades for Friedrich's work to once again attain its own identity separate from the Nazis. But his work, which was simultaneously dramatic and minimal, has also continued to influence visual artists in the modern movement, as well as creators in other disciplines. Irish playwright Samuel Beckett was really taken with Friedrich's art, and he first saw it when traveling through Germany in the 1930s. Friedrich's painting, Two Men Contemplating the Moon, was a direct influence on the development of Beckett's most famous play, Waiting for Godot. Friedrich's themes of nature as awesome, in the literal sense, not the casual usage meaning, still resonate. He was able to turn his talent to rendering landscapes in ways that were new and unsettling for his time, but also left viewers with a sense of nature being something deeply spiritual. We're going to close out with two quotes. One of them is about Friedrich and one is by him. The first is written by art historian William Bonn, who wrote in his biography of Friedrich, quote, Friedrich is essentially an observer who works from direct experience towards the intimation of an idea that is never fully expressed, never reaches the point of dogma or theory. And the second, as Tracy mentioned, is a quote from the artist himself, and it carries pretty clearly his entire ethos regarding painting landscapes with meaning and allegory. Quote, The artist should paint not only what he sees before him, but also what he sees within him. If, however, he sees nothing within him, then he should also refrain from painting that which he sees before him. Otherwise, his pictures will be like those folding screens behind which one expects to find only the sick or the dead. I really like that quote. (laughs) Basically, like, if your art doesn't have any feeling or emotion from you in it, it's dead art. It counts for nothing. Um, This is one of those artists who I did not recognize the name, as you predicted um, at the beginning of the show, that folks might not be able to, to bring his name immediately to mind. But... As soon as I started looking for artwork um, as examples, I was like, oh, yeah, that guy. He, like I said, everybody has seen his work, whether they know it or not. Um, I I really enjoy that. I mean, obviously, like, I like gloomy stuff. So some of his gloomier paintings I was really into when I was a teenager. <laughs> Uh, but even as I've gotten older and you kind of see the bigger expanse of his work, like I said, I love his his lighter paintings now in a way that I did not appreciate when I was younger. Um, so hopefully other people will find his work and love it as well. Do you have some listener mail for us? Uh, I do. I have some listener mail that's a little bit elderly. It's from uh, summer of last year. Uh, we're constantly sort of trying to pluck through and, and make sure we're reviewing our our email and our physical mail to try to get a good swath because we can't keep up with everybody's in terms of reading them on the air. But this one just made me chuckle. And because we've been talking about kind of a gloomy uh, assortment of images today, I thought it might be a a fun one. It's actually just a a suggestion, but it kind of delighted me. So I thought I would read it. Uh, This is from our listener, Ashley, who writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, I absolutely love your show. Today I found some interesting tidbits from, of all places, the Pioneer Woman magazine about the history of various lawn games. The magazine just had snippets, and so I started researching more and discovered there is way more to them than I ever would have guessed, such as bocce ball dates back to the Egyptians and that croquet was one of the first Olympic events competed in by a woman in the 1900 Paris Games. Recently, I've been catching up on episodes and hit a whole bunch of heavy topics all at once and thought maybe a lighthearted topic might be neat. Anyways, keep up the amazing work. You two are great. I agree. We're about due for a fun gamey episode, so I'm putting it on the list. I can't promise when it will happen. Um, But lawn games sound really (laughs) fun to me as well. Uh, And when this one first came in, I thought, oh, that does sound fun. And then I filed it. And here we are in February, January, wherever we are in the winter, (laughs) talking about dark artists. (laughs) If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. If you would like to subscribe to the podcast, we would like you to as well. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. 
For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 